Hi, I'm Carly Ross Seibert, and I'm joined today with Abby Shiano. Um, we are from Retail Alliance, and this is the Retail Alliance Retail Is podcast. And uh, today's episode of the Retail Is is brought to you by Downtown Hampton Development Partnership. The DHDP was established in 1996 to manage the Business Improvement District. The bid encompasses more than 350 businesses and property owners. The DHDP is committed to enhancing the physical beauty, commercial vitality, and distinguished character of Downtown Hampton. So learn more, you can head to downtownhampton.com. And today we are joined by Chris Smith and Robert Willie. Is that how you pronounce yeah. it? Yep. And they're both co-founders of Virginia Beer Company based out of Williamsburg. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So Abby, do you want to get started? Yeah, if you guys don't mind just kind of telling us a little bit about Virginia Beer Company and how it kind of came to be. Sure. So we are a, uh, like at this point, six and a half year old uh, craft brewery located in Williamsburg, just outside of uh, historic colonial Williamsburg, uh, adjacent to William & Mary's campus. And fittingly, that is where our story started. Chris and I are William & Mary alums. His wife, Erin, is also a William & Mary alum. And his youngest brother, Will, is also a William & Mary alum. So the tribe pride runs deep in the uh, roots of Virginia Beer Company. We met here at uh, university and stayed in touch. And I was the best man in Chris and Aaron's wedding. And we started falling in love with craft beer towards the end of our collegiate careers. Uh, you know, toast, toasting to a job well done at university and onward to our careers. Um, and we started uh, home brewing separately. Interest in craft beer, you know, ranged from trying to make it ourselves, uh, drinking as much as we could for research purposes, uh, visiting different breweries all across the country, just trying to learn about what was going on in the industry. We just fell in love with the idea that these craft breweries were so, uh, were such institutions in their communities, right? Businesses, people wanted to celebrate, people wanted to join, um, and, and the collegiality of the industry as well. The idea that people from brewery A would go spend time at brewery B, that these breweries would collaborate, uh, it just it was so different than the industries we found ourselves in. Uh, we were both in finance in the Washington, D.C. area for myself and then New York and Boston for Chris. So um, we were both successful in our careers, but it just wasn't a passion. And, and this passion for craft beer really sparked at William and Mary. And so the, whenever we would get together, especially for reunions and homecomings at, at William and Mary, um, the idea of coming back to Williamsburg where it all started and and doing something that would engage the community and that would build camaraderie, it just it just seemed like. A no-brainer. Why? Why wouldn't we come back to our college town and do it together as friends and and try to give something back to the community that brought us together? So it, it was a long journey, but here we are in 2022, and the brewery's been open for six and a half years, and uh, we've had many many rounds since. <laughs> Congratulations on that. Thank I'm you. A few other people. Um, I'm, so do you want to explain if it's who sort of encompasses the ownership and the other people that are involved in the business? Sure. Yeah. So Robbie and I are the co-founders. Um, we currently have a team of 20 people, actually. So we're, we're two of 20. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a production team that is six people strong, a sales team that is four people strong now, and then eight uh, people that work in kind of tap room and management as well. Um, so we've gone from, I think day one, we were, well, three, two, and then we became three. And then when we opened, I think we were seven and now we're 20. Wow. Have you always been in the same space? We have, yeah. We um, so this building that we're sitting in right now, um, we leased in December of 2014, mm -hmm. and it's a building that was built in 1960 by CNP Telephone, and it's on a side of town that um, I'd say you know it was kind of had gone downhill a little bit, not downhill in a bad way, but it was not really the focal point of the community. And uh, we first saw this building and it just looked like a brewery. It had been empty for many years, um, but it's a big open building. It has high ceilings, as you can see. Yeah. Uh, had a lot of the utilities that we needed to run a brewery. So we were really excited to find it. Um, it works very well for us. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, it took, a, it took a lot of build out, but, um, but, it, right. but it really functions nicely uh, from a beer garden, tap room and brewing perspective. Right. So you, you brew everything there. What about you talking about um, now distribution beyond local, it sounds like, to what, international, just domestic, we're talking? Uh, both. So we, we part, part of our plan, when we, when we decided on the name, the Virginia Beer Company, we wanted it to feel meaningful. We wanted it to feel vintage. Uh, the idea that, you know, Williamsburg in particular is a, a historic community that kind of helped spark um, uh, 
the colonies, the states, um, and and in, in many ways, uh, Virginia has really sparked the craft beer movement on the East Coast. So we wanted to be a part of that. We wanted to celebrate that worldwide. And so um, we currently, this is our first year distributing Virginia Beer Company beer throughout the entire Commonwealth of Virginia. So we um, have expanded our distribution in Virginia very methodically, wanting to make sure that the quality control was in place, that the production methods were in place, that if we if we sent beer to a bar or a restaurant or a grocery store, that it could always be there, that we wouldn't run short. And so we started in Hampton Roads, which is our home territory. We slowly moved into the Richmond area uh, and then Northern Virginia and then Western Virginia. And then we just tied off the, uh, the Eastern shore um, late last year. So this is our first year covering the entire state. But mm -hmm. actually, before we were in various parts of Virginia, our beer was being sent overseas to markets in the UK, Western Europe, uh, and Asia as well. And so right now, we've got beer uh, available in different volumes in the UK, France, the Netherlands, South Korea, Japan. Um, we've had some drops in Australia, New Zealand, um, and we're part of the Brewers Association's Export Development Program as well. So even if we don't have full time distribution uh, in other countries, our beer can frequently be found popping up at beer festivals in other countries as well. So uh, it's a big, a big part of our project. Chris will actually be taking uh, a trip to London later this month for the London Craft Beer Festival and a couple tap takeovers. And um, after after no travel at all for the past two and a half years, this will actually be the brewery's uh, second in-person trip to London this year alone. Oh, great. So you you mentioned all these countries. So and what was the company or the, the, the organization that's helping you internationally you would just the, mention, the yeah. brewers association is our trade group um okay. for craft breweries independent craft breweries but they have an um an export development program within the the trade group oh that's interesting yeah because i was going to say how do you even know where to start <laughs> you know, yeah. manufacturing and distribution and i mean yeah that's yeah we get we actually got really lucky. So there's the export development program, which has a lot of resources for us and provides us with a lot of support. But beyond that, um, we got lucky in the fact that we're in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, the Virginia Economic Development Partnership has an international trade arm that offers unbelievable resources for export. Um, so we engaged with them actually first in 2016 mm -hmm. and discussed our interest in exporting. And, and they shared a lot of information with us that you know was new to us. And uh, we yeah. realized that we weren't quite ready to export beer. So I think in early 2019, we actually started sending beer. Um, but we've been supported by the Commonwealth of Virginia the entire way. And right now, actually, we're in a program called Valet, which is the Virginia Leaders in Export Trade, where they mm -hmm. provide us with some financing, consultants, all kinds of support that really helps us grow our export business. So uh, from that, I don't think, you know, if we'd been in, in another state, I don't think we'd be as far along with our export business as we are. Yeah. Oh, that sounds amazing. I, I've not heard of that. So that's good knowledge to have. So do you, and going back to what I was saying, do you manufacture and only export or do you actually manufacture overseas? So, yeah, so everything that we brew is brewed right here uh, in Williamsburg, Virginia. So we've, we've built out a robust facility. Um, you know, part of the reason uh, that we teamed up with a with a uh, professional brewmaster who joined us, his name is Jonathan. Uh, he came from a much larger brewery than the one that we initially wanted to open. And the idea was that we could ramp up our production facility here to support not just domestic markets, but overseas markets. So we've invested in uh, stainless steel tanks, our own canning equipment, our own lab equipment. Um, we, we've got a robust facility here for storage of, of cans and raw materials as well, grain and hops and yeast. And so everything that is produced and brewed is brewed right here on 401 Second Street. And then through our various distribution channels, a lot of a lot of shipping knowledge that that uh, we've had to pick up along the way. Um, we get you know, kegged and canned and bottled beer from here in Williamsburg to um, various facilities that then repackage them and get them to their final destinations, whether it's throughout Virginia uh, in our market in New York. We do send some beer to New York State as well or overseas. Okay. I am. Um, I mean, did you want to ask some questions? I did. No, I took. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so going back just a little bit, when you guys were at William and Mary, did you have something like Virginia Beer Company to go and hang out? Or were you guys kind of like the first in the area? So I know it's a big deal for college students to have a brewery. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. <clears throat> uh, there was a brewery in Williamsburg. It was called the Williamsburg Brewing Company. Uh, and then in 2006, it kind of changed hands and became Aleworks Brewing Company, which is still open okay. today. Yeah. Uh, so we, you know, at that time in Virginia, the laws were different where uh, you couldn't actually have a full tasting room and beer garden. 
Mm -hmm. Um, You could offer people a tour and then a sampling, which was limited to maybe eight ounces. So going to breweries wasn't as big of a, you know, thing back then. Uh, So I think we did that a couple of times, but the place that really uh, brought us together was the Greenleaf Cafe, which is still here in town. Uh, Last week, we actually had a two night tap take over there. So we got to revisit our roots. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that's where we started drinking craft beer together. And I think that's where the the first time we ever talked about opening a brewery was, um, you know, on two bar stools at the Greenleaf Bar. (laughs) That's really cool. I know that I went to Longwood and Farmville and we didn't have a brewery until maybe four or five years ago called Three Roads. And yeah, it was a huge deal. I don't like beer myself. I'm so sorry. And so I, I go there, I have water and popcorn and I'm good. <laughs> nice. And, that, and that's that, that you, you just kind of hit the nail on the head though. Like the idea for us that people can come to our brewery and do that very same thing. You know, we host different, different um, uh, community pop-ups, whether it's partnerships with nonprofits, whether it's live music on the weekends, speed quizzing trivia on Thursdays, you know, free to play. You don't have to drink beer or, or even enjoy beer to come to the brewery and enjoy the space, right? We've got Wi-Fi, we've got food trucks. We sell Virginia chips. We sell Virginia peanuts. We've got gourmet sodas. We have non-alcoholic kombucha on tap. Uh, the idea is that it's a community gathering space for all ages. Uh, and that's really what we loved about kind of Williamsburg in general. I mean, coming from bigger cities, the D.C. area, New York, Boston, et cetera. Uh, Williamsburg you, you, is a community that you can get involved with and it, it gives back to you what you give it. And then at the same time, um, you know, we enjoy the green leaf space so much. And obviously for us, part of that was working our way through their 40 taps over the course of a responsible amount of time, obviously, but also that we, we felt at home there. It was comfortable, right? Like it was dim lighting. It was, it was familiar faces. It was good beer, good food. Uh, and it was just a, a great place to get together, whether we were in school or alums coming back just for a weekend. And we want people to feel that way about our brewery. So the fact that you're saying that about three roads um, and we were actually lucky enough, they, they were with us in London for the brew London beer festival cool. a couple months ago. So we got to know some of their team, which was great. Um, but that's the idea. We want people to feel like, hey, whether I'm drinking or not drinking, whether I do drink or don't drink, um, they want to be at Virginia Beer Company. Right. Yeah. And as you say, like, there's not that many industries and coming from finance, I'm sure you you experience it where the competition talks to each other and actually helps. We've got a couple other breweries um, involved with Retail Alliance and they've actually helped mentor other brewers like it's, it, to open up i mean it's it's quite a unique industry did you know that going in or is it just something you just happen chance that it was that you were left out oh i think it's definitely one of the things that drew us to the industry because we were the beneficiaries of of some of those breweries that came before us offering advice and insight um teaching us sharing contractors sharing equipment information i mean i think it's, it is a very unique industry in that way and and I don't think we would have opened the brewery that we ended up opening if we hadn't had all that assistance from from breweries, you know, here and elsewhere. Uh, and and since we opened, you know, we were the third brewery in the area. We've tried to do the same. I think we're going to be at nine or ten breweries soon in a, in a few months here. Um, so we always try to do the same and and kind of, you know, pass it along all the information and knowledge that we've gained. When you say you're going to be at the other breweries, does that mean that they will sell your brews, or you're just going to go help them? No, we just try to help them in whatever way possible. Yeah, it's it's definitely unique. It's and you know it's changed a bit. There's a little bit more competition than there used to be, but I think still at the the, the soul of it, it's still the same. People, it really attracts people who want to help other people and are just generally friendly and excited to be in the industry. Mm-hmm. So let's get into the science of it just a little bit, because um, like Abby, I I don't know a huge amount about beer. I find I struggle, I do struggle to find a beer that I like. Um, so, but I've, I found for some reason I really like dark beers, which I never thought I would. Um, so explain a little bit about how it all happens, how you choose the flavours, where you get your ingredients, how, I mean, how many taste tests you have to have. I mean, like, just explain a little bit about all that. That'd be great. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a lot of group think. And I think one of the things that we take pride in is that we have a lot of voices as part of the conversation. You know, it started off with me and Chris, but um, you know, Chris's wife, Aaron, was involved in the conversation from the get-go. Our families were involved in helping us define the branding and encourage us to get started. When our brewmaster joined us, you know, there, there were ideas that he had coming from his both professional days and homebrew days. 
Uh, and then as our taproom manager joined us and as our assistant taproom manager who became our sales director joined us, like everyone had different ideas and opinions. And the group think is what makes us, I think, come out with beers and uh, events that that feel almost larger than the business itself. They, they feel more refined and as if they belong to a larger brewery. And we take pride in that. And so from a, from a recipe development standpoint, you know, our production team kind of takes the charge with actually building the recipes, right? That's what they're trained to do. Our brewmaster has a background in brewing, so he can put together different different malts, different grains, the yeast that goes with it, the hops, and when you add the hops, and when you add different other adjuncts, such as uh, fruit uh, for some of our fruited sours. But but the, the concept for those beers, even before you get to the written recipes, starts with a conversation in the office about, well, what, what beers do we have on tap right now? How many IPAs do we have? How many light beers? How many dark beers? How many sour beers? What do we need to make our rotation more attractive to a wider audience? What do we do to, to offer diversity and hopefully help someone find the, the first beer they're ever gonna love, or maybe help someone find the next beer they're gonna love. Mm -hmm. um, and so we try to offer a, a specific variety, but, but the, the idea, the conception of how our tap list is built, how our 16 taps are filled with light to dark and hoppy to sour is, is really focused on group thinking, group conversation. So it's, it's a full spectrum and you can be the newest person in the tap room or one of the co-founders and you've got equal voice in terms of adding ideas to the mix because we want to have a constantly rotating mix of beers and recipes and flavors. Right. And did you know when you started out, like how long you'd keep a beer for before you then change the flavor? Like, is that all just trial and error? Uh, we actually, <clears throat> so we had four beers that we opened with that we knew we'd have all the time available in the tap room and, you know, at restaurants and grocery stores and things like that. Um, so we still have four but um they, we've we've taken a couple out over the years and added a couple of new ones mm -hmm. um but then beyond so beyond those this was always our plan with our brewery we actually built a brewery that has two brew houses and the brew houses are kind of the most fixed part of a brewery in terms of the volume so on our big brew house we can do about a thousand gallons of beer at a time and that's a pretty sizable brew house um, that helps us for those year-round beers to have enough beer to send to all of our different markets okay. and then we also built um a brew house that is about 150 gallons, so a lot smaller. And it gives us the ability to brew a lot of different beers on a smaller scale that last year, maybe one to three weeks. Um, so we tend to release anywhere between two and three beers, new beers every single week. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, we have 16 beers on tap at the brewery uh, right here. And most of them never leave the brewery um, unless we hit on something that, you know, the consumer really loves or we really love and we want to expand it into a beer that's going to go to the market to the wider market mm -hmm. um, so that's really the fun part of what we do it's a little stressful i think last year i think we did like a 130 different beers um which you know in terms of logistics and planning and ingredients and labels and all those things is a challenge mm -hmm. but um you know next to the year-round beers that we always have so people always know they're going to find a certain beer that they might love then there's the variety so we kind of cater to both sides of that, of people who are just interested in in what's new and exciting and different. So we, we do both sides of that coin. Wow. So when you started out, I mean, how did you know you were going to need such a big space to, did, I mean, was your dream to be international, to, you know, to be where you are? Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was very well thought out. And, and, and some of that was by design and some of that was because it took a lot longer to open than we expected. So we had a lot more time on our hands to redevelop the plan over and over again. But the, the focal point was was to to make really good craft beer available at as many places as possible and make it affordable. And to do that, you've got to have a talented production team. You've got to have an investment in, in the lab and the science to make sure the beer tastes good when it leaves the brewery. And then you also have to brew a lot of it. You know, it's, it's economies of scale. The more the more you brew a certain recipe, the more affordable we can we can make it. Right? You know, higher higher volume. Uh, we can order more cans up front, so we're getting a volume discount on the number of cans that we order. Um, even from a labor perspective, knowing that someone can fill all the kegs in one in one day, as opposed to across multiple days, um, you know, for different small batches, it, it all it all comes into a more affordable but but still highest possible quality craft beer experience. And we wanted people to discover their 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 you know hopefully their next favorite craft beer and to do that you've got to go beyond the walls of your brewery so we wanted to build a big space um but we also as a group decided that we wanted to have that the ability to have some variety and so building the two breweries in one building the large system 
to make affordable, high quality craft beer that's available elsewhere, but also that small system so our brewers can have fun and be playful. We can do small projects. We can team up with nonprofit organizations and brew beers for them. We can team up with other breweries and brew collaborations. And that's what makes give or take, um, you know, eight, eight of our tap or eight to 12 of our taps change on a weekly basis, right? Like if you, if you come in here every Monday for a month, there's probably going to be at least one to two new beers every Monday when you come in because the small batches come and go and that's our test kitchen, right? If, if a small batch does really, really well, it might get bumped to the bigger system. It might get called up to the big leagues. So um, it's, it's fun. We let, we let the community give us feedback. Um, we let our full-time friends, social club, our regulars give us feedback. And, and we see what does really well and what should be maybe moved up to a larger batch for, for future uh, consumption outside of Williamsburg. So um, I was going to ask another question. Oh, yeah, that was what. Have you got a sample of your can by any chance around you? Yeah, I'll bear it back. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So my yeah, question would be, it. do you have um, someone who designs the labels? Like, do you change them up? Like, how did you even get to that point? And yeah, so we, we cool actually, uh, it's it's funny, the, the I think the art and the design, the branding is probably the most, the most interesting, but also maybe the most time consuming part of the job, um, because the people, people see a brand before they taste the beer, right? Whether it's how the name is written on the chalkboard, whether it's the can, the box on a 12 pack, uh, the case box, even that, that holds 24 cans at the grocery store, right? And yeah. so we first started, we, we started off kind of with a few friends who were a little more gifted than we were um, on the graphic design side, submitting some ideas for us. And then um, we, we'd met some various artists along the way who had submitted designs for us. So we definitely went through a, ma a maturation process until we got to where we are now with our primary design. Um, and, and that was serendipity, right? We, we had built a website, we had started social media. We really just wanted to get the name out there before we even had a space or beer to sell. We just wanted people to know what we were all about. So we built a brand before we had any beer associated with the brand. Um, and a, a graphic designer out of Harrisonburg, Virginia, reached out to us and said, I love what you guys are trying to build in Williamsburg. I've been following it. I love the Virginia craft beer scene. It's grown so much. Uh, I think I can help you like really focus your brand in a manner that'll get the message across uh, without people having to read everything in your website, without people having to know your entire backstory. And yeah. we've been with uh, that graphic designer since uh, before the brewery opened. And, and it's been great because he's really helped us refine our our look and our feel over the past eight years. Wow, okay. So let's, let's see. <laughs> so here's an example of one of our four year-round beers. This is okay. called Flavors. It's our Hazy IPA, mm -hmm. um, most popular beer um, that we make. Uh, so this is actually a recent uh, brand refresh in the past two months, maybe um kind of our first major refresh i think actually in six years we've done some tweaking uh you know kind of every other year but this is a this is a major refresh for us um so these are what are all our uh 12 ounce six packs look like okay. but then you know we talk about the variety and, and where we get to be creative and that's yeah. with all of our 16 ounce four packs um so for like, example okay. there's a lot of different beers here but this is called fresh pick um this is a fruited sour beer with blueberries and marion berries mm -hmm. so they all have the same template um here's another example uh, this is called good with faces this is another hazy ipa okay emoji driven um so we do two or three of these basically every week with a brand new can label um of all kinds of different beers oh. <laughs> there's an english beer um you know they're all there's just there's a lot hard to keep up with i can only imagine um, and, yeah, there's there's a lot of group think involved again right like we it, our graphic designers not coming up with the names of the beers the styles of the beer once we've developed a style and, and come up with a name that fits the next step is specifically to work as a team to, to brainstorm what we think would help translate the style and the name and then we send it to our graphic designer and sometimes he listens to us and sometimes he completely throws away our notes and does his own thing and it's up to decide, you know, wh whether the the artist rendering is what we were hoping for, or whether we need to go back to the drawing board. But um, you know, he's he's really helped us kind of put put it all together uh, in an actual label perspective. Right. So it sounds like it's swapped around in terms of uh, the timing wise, and instead of him coming to you now, you're sort of developing a little bit more to be able to then pass it off for him to design. So yeah, and then, and there's obviously been trust and some faith built in over the past years. You know, he's helped us 
really, really zero in on the brand. And, and it's a constant changing process too, right? We're actually going through a core refresh. So our, our core cans, the Freeverse cans that Chris showed you earlier, um, those looked completely different two months ago. And that after six years, we decided it was time to you know add kind of a new look and a new flair to, to both uh, acknowledge where we are as a company, but also acknowledge where the craft beer industry is. It's changed dramatically since we opened in 2016. So uh, we, you, you can't rest on your laurels. You kind of have to constantly be evolving. And so you know, the, the, the breadth and depth of our offerings have evolved uh, and the look and feel of our brand has evolved. The, the, the soul is still the same, but you've got to kind of adapt to what's going on around you. And that's, I think, important for any small business. And what's the initial feedback being? It, uh, it's just kind of rolling out there all positive yeah uh, we actually you know it's just in terms of how long it takes to to get these things and logistics wise we finished this redesign last december um mm -hmm. and we ordered cans in december and they arrived in june um so it's just a very long lead time on on a lot of the ingredients and packaging materials that that we use um mm -hmm. so we've lived with it for a long time and we're starting to see it now in the market and and the reaction's been good it's it looks great on the shelves we think Mm -hmm. See, sure right. keep coming yeah. in. I and mean, we've got lots of questions to go, and I know we're probably out of time. We Sorry. are out of time. I was going to say that. I feel like we could talk to you guys oh, probably for two hours and not even start to understand really the whole thing of you guys do. Well, oh, just we have to come uh, come join us over over a beer, and we'll uh, we'll continue the conversation. I actually yeah. think we're having a meet and greet um, oh, yes. in for September. Yes, that is definitely accurate. I, I can't say September six. Is that right? September yeah. six, I believe. Cool. I will be there. I um, I'm in a podcast. Right. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Interruption. It's fine. We're good. Yeah. Um, but I want to try that sour one of the purple blue can. Yeah. Yeah. It's like something I'd like. Yeah, yeah. We always you know come in and get splashes, and our our team we we're, we're very blessed with a great team. We've actually had a lot of consistency. People who have been with us since day one, um, still behind the bar and still hanging out and. Um, familiar faces, I think, also create um, you know, a following and people who, who trust recommendations. And so our team's definitely here to guide you through the yeah, experience. You I just like that. Yeah. And talk through the ingredients. And, you know, we're all about community and engagement. And that's just part of that process. Yeah, it's awesome. And we didn't really get much into sort of the community. And you said you work with nonprofits and stuff. So it'll have to be another discussion another day. That's right. That's, that's, that still sounds good to us. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for joining us. It's been really interesting uh, to chat to you guys. So thank you. So, thank Abby, you, you want to wrap up? Okay. Yep. You've been listening to the Retail Us podcast. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, you can find more at retailalliance.com slash retails dash is dash podcast or search YouTube for Retail Alliance. I'm Abby Shayano. And I'm Kylie Ross-Sibert. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.